everyone. On behalf of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, we are so grateful that you're able to join us for, believe it or not, our eighth episode of our video blog series, Conversations on Conservation and Animal Welfare. Today's special episode is a celebration of two very relevant days in March, International Women's Day and World Wildlife Day. These days of celebration coincide with IFAW's mission of fresh thinking and bold action for animals, people, and the places we call home so perfectly that we knew we had to do a special broadcast just on those topics. The format of this episode will consist of a lively roundtable discussion with some of the dedicated women of IFAW that you see right here, followed by a question and answer segment. My name is Sabrina Foley, and I'm the Global Marketing Manager for IFAW. I have my assistant with me today, Captain Kirk, and I'm honored to have um, my fellow women colleagues of IFA join us so this, for the special broadcast of Women in Conservation. Cheryl, Tammy, Katie, Phoebe, and Terry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Everyone. Great everyone. to be here. Hi, everyone. Hi, ladies. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for joining me for our season two premiere episode. Today, um, before we get started to all the amazing details, I would love for you guys to just go around the room, the room, and introduce yourself to our audience today. Sure. Hi, my name is Cheryl Fink. I'm the Director of Wildlife Campaigns for IFA's Canada office. I've been working with IFA for 23 years, and I'm just really happy to be here tonight with all of you. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Tammy Palmer. I am the Executive Vice President of a Business Management and Strategy here at IFA. I have been in the field of conservation for about 10 years and then the field of international development under which conservation sits for approximately uh, 25 years. And I've been with IFA for 10 months. So it's wonderful to be here. Hi hey everyone, I'm Katie Miller. I'm the Deputy Vice President for International Operations, supporting our country offices around the world. I'm based on Cape Cod at our International Operations Center, and I have been with IFA for almost 15 years. Great to be here. Hi, my name is Phoebe Mossy. I'm a donor relations specialist, also based at the International Operations Center in Yarmouth Port. And I started with IFA back in 1993, part-time when we had a night crew, and I have been full-time since 2002. And I am just thrilled to be here with this evening with you. Hi everyone, I'm Terry Caramanos. I'm the Vice President for Global Development. I work with um, an amazing group of fundraising colleagues in over 15 offices around the globe, many of whom interact with you on a regular basis. So thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening. I've been in the field of fundraising for about 35 years and I have been at IFA for three. Thank you so much, ladies. It's such a pleasure to have you join us today. I'm so excited for this episode. And truly how great is it that this is just really a, such a small sampling of the incredibly devoted, hardworking, passionate, strong, intelligent, and glass ceiling shattering women that make up IFA. I am truly honored to be part of this group of amazing women spearheading all this great work for animals and conservation. Now, as many of you know, we are an international organization with colleagues and offices all over the globe, but due to the time differences and the nature of our work, such as disasters and animal related emergencies, many of our coworkers want, who wanted to take part weren't able to, including Celine, our country director from France, who has reached out to our audience about Nania and our Benin Dogs project. Kinda from Dubai, who has shared with us the need for help in places like Yemen and Syria. And Jacqueline, who works tirelessly in our East Africa office, reporting on the truly incredible work that's happening in our African region. And of course, Team Lioness, the first ever women to secure formal jobs as rangers in the patriarchal Maasai community. Team Lioness recorded a very special introduction for you. It is, I think, 4 a.m. their time, so pardon the uh, recording. <laughs> Here we go on a quick trip to Amboseli National Park in southern Kenya. See you soon. 
Hi, I'm Stacy Kobos, Vice President of Communications and Marketing at IFPA. And a big part of my job is to make sure that the world is aware of the amazing work happening around the globe to save as many animal lives as possible and protect their critical habitat so people like you can get involved and support these efforts. I've been given the great honor of introducing IFOS Team Lioness, our all-female ranger unit based in Kenya. I hope you've heard about their work and their stories in media outlets like CNN and The Guardian and many others. They're empowered by their communities. They are breaking boundaries. They're protecting critical wildlife. And we are just so proud of them and inspired by them daily. I know you will be as well. They are out in the field, so they can't be with us in person. So they've recorded this message for us. I hope you'll enjoy and take as much inspiration from them as I do daily. And together you are? Team, Team Lioness. I'm the first woman to become to become a, a ranger in our community. So it's so amazing. Another thing, it's in our community we are now seeing as we are empowered as the women. So I'm feeling so happy. When I go back to the community, they will see like I'm a very important person. Our hardest day when we are, we are in patrol, we meet the buffalo and then we know the buffalo is a very dangerous animal. So we don't know and then the buffalo is very near. So we don't know how to escape. This one lie down and this one, but this one is the near to the buffalo. But me, I'm back. This one, you want to cry. And then this one, to tell her, don't, <laughs> don't cry. Because if the buffalo hear that sound, you see them, is lying down. But me, I run away, this buffalo see me. So he get confused. He say, can I follow the one who running? But he didn't see people lying down. But I ran and then the buffalo ran and then I go up the tree. But the time we, we come again together, we are very afraid. So even I have my friend there called Beatrice. He said, I'm giving this job. I don't need this job again. <laughs> but the time we walk like two kilometers, we encourage each other. We say it's our job and then we, lo we love our Lord life. So, we can be let us to be strong because this job is very hard in women so that we see us we do a job with a man can do a woman can do better so that is bring our family to be happy we are just a woman like you we have children like you we are married like you so we are like a good example to the community we protect the wildlife for the coming generation and they come and benefit through the wildlife being educated and being hard working and work we are showing them it is very easy very easy nothing has changed literally we have been more than more beautiful there than there before <laughs> okay. i wish to protect wildlife so that they increase in the future without wildlife no human beings and without human beings no wildlife because all we are god's creation so we all we must live in the same land. I want all wildlife to be safe. That's my wish. <laughs> wow, how impactful was that? Thank you, Team Lioness. I love hearing those stories. I mean, they're scared, um, but they're doing this amazing work and that the men are realizing nothing's changed. We can do it too. And we're not changing everything. We're protecting just like they are. So in a male dominated world of wildlife rangers, this group has truly busted gender stereotypes by empowering women to take up roles previously thought to be the sole domain of men. IFAL is so proud to have 17 women rangers protecting wildlife all around the world. And not only does this help the wildlife, but also the women's families providing a source of income and showing young girls the possibilities of their future. Without the help of our supporters, these types of empowering projects wouldn't be possible. 
in everything IFA does, we ensure that we are supporting the communities where we work through education and livelihoods. So they too can help protect their native wildlife. Katie, I know that you hold dearly a special in-person event that raised more than $300,000 for the Ambaseli Tsavo Kilimanjaro landscape in Kenya. Can you tell our audience today why this event meant, means so much to you and what were the successes as a result for the animals and the community? Sure, Sabrina, happy to. And watching that video about Team Lioness just reminds me, you know, I think it's important to share that as an international organization working, you know, across offices across the world, supporting work in more than 50 countries, we work across vastly different cultural political contexts. It's very different working in Beijing working in Kenya, working in France or Dubai. And, and we really, in order to be effective, we really have to be culturally aware, culturally sensitive, culturally savvy. And one of the key ways that we do that at IFA is through our regional teams. So rather than sending staff around to implement projects across the world, we rely on our local teams and it's they who lead and implement the work on the ground. Um, and they have the language skills, they have the knowledge of the customs, traditions um, and context of the place, they come from that place. And so it's really critical to us that, that, we, that we follow through on that. And so getting to your question, uh, yes, back in 2015, we were brand new to fundraising through events and our Ambaseli Savo Kilimanjaro project, we really needed to raise funds to support that project. And so we took on the challenge. We weren't quite sure. We were a little bit hesitant about how, how we would do, but in the end, thanks to really incredible teamwork and also our, our amazing donors who really came through for us, we were able to raise those funds. Um, and they had an immediate tangible impact on the ground in the project. Uh, they supported land leasing from thousands of small landholders. And this is a really key strategy for us um, to maintain connectivity for elephants, for wildlife, but also for the local Maasai communities who use that land communally. Um, it also supported our community scouts, of which Team Lioness is an example. They are preventing poaching and they are preventing human wildlife conflict. It supports our wonderful scholarship program, which offers secondary and tertiary um, higher education opportunities for young people from the OOGR Maasai community. Um, and finally, it supported infrastructure. So in order to secure a sustainable future for that landscape, Ecotourism is, is a way to do that, and the infrastructure development is a key first step to achieving that. So um, yeah, it was a very rewarding experience, steep learning curve, um, and I've been so impressed really since that time to see how the project has evolved and the, the impact that we've achieved since then. Thank you, Katie. That's such a, a beautiful story. I love hearing those amazing successes that come out of these type of events and really for years to come. 2015 was six years ago, yeah. right? Are we 2021 already? That's incredible. Thank you, Katie. And I'm really glad that you brought up the international community and how having our colleagues native to those areas often makes all the difference in our ability to make a significant impact. It's truly remarkable. Thank you, Katie. Now, Cheryl, as a woman, who's very hands-on position as the director of the Canadian Wildlife Campaigns, and especially our work to end the commercial seal hunt. I'm sure you have an extensive library of gender stereotypes that you have come face to face with. Can you share with our audience today a story from the field and to put a positive spin on it, the success for the animals that came from that? Sure, Sabrina, thank you. Um, as you know, for many years, one, of, one aspect of my job with IFA was traveling to the commercial seal hunt on the east coast of Canada to film and document and observe what was happening there. Um, and you're right, I stood out a little bit. I've never seen a, feel, a female seal hunter out there on the ice. So for better or worse, I stood out. And you, you mentioned gender stereotypes. And I think a lot of times the seal hunters were just shocked and surprised to see a woman there. Um, I think they were surprised to see, to see a woman 
not only there, but not crying or hysterical. I think that, you know, they had all of these beliefs about how a woman would be acting at, at, at such a situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just the, you know, not being what they expected, not behaving in the way that they expected, um, it helped us to sort of diffuse what could be a potentially violent and dangerous situation on the ice. And it allowed us to have conversations rather than conflict. So I think that that was a positive. And I think also, I'm just, I'm so happy that all of our work and going to the ice and filming the cruelty that happens there, the positive impact of that was realized um, in that that footage was being used to, to support the European Union ban on seal products that happened in 2009 which was a tremendous victory for IFA and for the SEALs. When we're on the ice, what we're observing there is extremely difficult to watch. It's, it's dangerous, it's hard to watch. And just knowing that the video that we were obtaining was going to be used for a greater good to save the lives of over 5 million SEAL pups, that made it, I wouldn't say all worthwhile, but it made it a lot better and a lot more tolerable. And I'm just, I'm glad to have been part of that. Um, it wasn't easy. This was a 45 year campaign. It involved generations of campaigners to get this ban in place and to close the markets for sealed products. So it's a long-term commitment, um, but it, it was one of the greatest successes I think that we've achieved for animals. Thank you, Cheryl. And you know, I don't think a lot of us here today and audiences and worldwide would have what it takes to go head to head with um, sealers in the, that situation. So on behalf of everyone, Cheryl, thank you for being someone who can do that because it's incredible work. And I always like to say, I think I sprinkle it in in every vlog that I fall is here for the long haul. And this is just perfect case in point, 40 plus years of what you said, generational work of people really dedicated to this, but look at the outcome to ban the seal products. I mean, that's a huge deal. And that was all thanks to the people devoted and persistent and keeping at it. So thank you, Cheryl. It's such amazing work that takes years, but so worth it. All of you here today really have such amazing stories and thoughts on what you, where you see conservation and animal welfare going in the future as it pertains to women in the movement. I'd like to open this up to all of you to give us um, an elaboration to our audience today, specifically younger generations who love animals but may not know where to go from there. I know I was in that position at one point and I'm sure many other people are too, right? You're like, okay, I'm a vet or nothing. <laughs> so let's talk about this a little bit. Phoebe, Tammy, and Terry, can you please tell me your thoughts about this? Sure, thank you, Sabrina. I hope a lot of young females are watching right now and are encouraged what they learn today. I feel this is the perfect time for women to become more involved in conservation and animal welfare. As you know, women are finally being recognized as being capable of doing the same work as men and bringing a fresh perspective to many of the traditionally male-dominated fields. Now with the election of our first woman and first woman of color to the office of vice president of the United States, girls and young women all over have a wonderful role model and a true inspiration. Team Lioness, as you could see by the video we just watched are getting much deserved recognition and bringing a whole fresh look to what was always considered man's work. I came to IFA myself after having spent over 20 years in the aviation industry, which is also typically dominated by men. Although I felt I had to work twice as hard to get the same recognition as they did, I did earn their respect when they saw I was capable of doing the same work. The day I took my check ride for my private pilot's license was probably the biggest achievement. The FAA examiner was a very, very macho retired Air Force colonel, and I was almost afraid to get in the airplane with him. <laughs> um, when the exam was over, he told my flight instructor that he had never seen better instrument work on a private pilot flight test. I knew then that there was no turning back. We were certainly capable of doing everything a man could do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what our education or our work backgrounds are. If you are interested in the conservation and animal welfare movement, this is the time to step in and help to protect people, animals, and the place that we all call home. No longer do we need to accept being told that we can't do something because we're girls, like mm -hmm. my own generation and those who came before me were told so often. Our momentum is building and there's absolutely no turning back now. The future looks very bright for the role of women in this movement around the world. 
wow, Phoebe, <laughs> there's so much that, that's there to uh, build upon and to, to, to feed on. You know what, I, I'm really struck by your reference to our new uh, first female vice president and vice president um, of, of color. And you know, when I see a vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, what really comes to mind for me is really the shoulders of all of the giants that her work is resting on, right? Those generation of activists across communities, uh, social justice warriors, um, uh, sort of female uh, sort of activists as well, and, and, and all activists who have really helped us to realize the moment that we are in. And when you think about communities and generations, I think that that's the operative word because when I reflect on what Sabrina sort of asked about in terms of, you know, where is conservation going and how do women sort of intersect with the sort of the leading edge of that. It's about community-based conservation for me. And women are absolutely on the front lines um, of that community-based uh, conservation approach. Uh, you will recognize, and we'll talk a little bit more later on about my uh, all of our work, but my work in particular really is in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so when I think about East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, you know, population growth is uh, an extraordinarily ish, an extraordinary issue, excuse me, on the continent. And those population growth rates really do um, create sort of situations in terms of wildlife conflict, uh, sort of human wildlife conflict. And then you add on the increased pressures in terms of land and scarce resources with regard to agriculture. And one of the things that's really relevant there is that women make up the backbone of the agricultural labor force within uh, the African context. So when we talk about community-based conservation, we are inherently talking about women on the front lines of that. And I really do believe that it is the work of organizations like IFA, but other community-based conservation organizations as well to develop the appropriate tools that will allow women, but the larger community to achieve the conservation impacts that we are most interested in. So it's, it's inextricable for me. Yeah, that's right, Tammy. I think that women have always been leaders in the conservation movement. I am reminded of my time in Australia meeting a network of carers of wildlife. And this is generations of women who've been doing this work in Australia. And then younger women who've been out planting trees with their young children and families, setting an example for the next generation so we can create corridors for koalas and, and habitats. It's really quite amazing. And you know, it never surprises me, but there's a reason why we call it mother nature. I love that saying, Terry. You know, you never really think about, oh, Mother Nature, that does make sense. And, you know, I always think about what Kamala said when she won a vice presidency. She said, I, I am the first, but I'm not the last. And that really resonates on so many levels for just women all over the world. And it's truly remarkable. So thank you so much for your thoughts on that of where you see women going in conservation and animal welfare in the future. Now we have so many attendees joining us today all over the world. I'm so excited to get to the question and answer segment. So to make sure we have ample time, I'm just going to stick with two, technically three more questions for you all, and then we'll get to the question and answer segment of the broadcast. The first question is, what important message do you want to get across to the viewers today? The second question is, do you have any personal animal stories that may have pushed you into the animal welfare or conservation world and interest? And this third one is more for um, Captain Kirk here. He made me, well, he's sleeping. He made me um, add it in here for you. So do you have any pets that you would like to introduce to our audience today and maybe share the spotlight with them for the Q&A segment? <clears throat> No, th thanks, Sabrina. I think for me, the most important thing I've learned through my time at IFA is the importance of persistence. When we're trying to change behavior, when we're trying to change wildlife policy, these are not easy things. It doesn't happen in one year, three years, five years. 
as we've seen, it can take generations of work um, and just persistence. And I think the key message there for me is just to, to never give up, keep sight of your goal, be flexible, adapt your approach as necessary. You might need to change with the, the times or the environment, but keeping sight of your goal and doing whatever it takes to achieve, to achieve what you're trying to achieve. And for IFA, that's saving the lives of animals. I think to me, that's the important thing. Um, in terms of a, an animal story, I always loved animals. As you said, I wanted to be a vet at one point too, and that wasn't working out. And then uh, I went to university to study wildlife biology. I thought that could be another way that I could you know, help animals. Um, and the seal hunt was actually a presented to us as a case study in one of our fourth year courses. And it was presented sort of as an example of how wildlife policy decisions are not usually based on science, they're based on politics. And I think that's what sort of drew me to this field. It was more the human aspect of it and how we could change our behaviors, how we could change laws to create better policies for animals. Um, so it was almost more the, more the human side. I love animals, but it was the human side of it that brought me to IFA. And you know, as we were saying earlier, I never knew that this sort of career would have existed when I was younger. I thought you were a vet and you know maybe a biologist, but I'm just really pleased that I've been able to to be with IFA for so long and making an impact for animals in the way that we have. Um, pets, I don't have any pets right now. We used to have uh, two retired racing dog, racing greyhounds. Unfortunately, they've passed on. So we're just waiting for the time is right so that we can share our lives with animals again. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, you know, when we think about sort of the, the things that motivate us and, and the wisdom that we would pass on to those who are coming into this field in terms of conservation, I always think about um, something that the founder of my previous uh, sort of institution that I worked with, which is the Jane Goodall Institute. Something that Jane Goodall said very frequently, both in public and in private, was that every individual matters. Every individual can make a difference and every individual has a role to play. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you're doing. You can make that difference. And Phoebe's, I think, is going to tell us a little bit more later about specifically, you know, what we can do in terms of, of conservation. But that's just something that I think is so empowering because those individual actions really do accumulate an amount to the impact that we want to see and achieve in the world. Um, just in terms of when I fell in love with conservation, when I fell in love with animals, I, I've been so fortunate because I actually, in, in preparation for this discussion tonight, I was thinking about all the different countries I've been to. And so far I'm up to 32. And so I've actually got an opportunity to see so many animals in their natural habitats. And that is extraordinary. And that's a gift. But uh, the gift that touched me the most was going to the Republic of Congo and to the chimpanzee sanctuary in the Republic of Congo. And I, an I had an opportunity to interact with um, a, a true visionary as well, who was a veterinarian uh, at, at the Republic of Congo in that sanctuary. And she took care of hundreds of chimpanzees that were captured as a result of the illegal uh, wildlife trade in the Republic of Congo. And I saw this individual be a compassionate, um, adoptive parent, if you will, to these hundreds of chimpanzees. I saw this person be a policymaker alongside stakeholders in the Republic of Congo. I saw this person be a, a fierce uh, and vocal advocate uh, with donors to also um, sort of get the money that was required to run this type of institution. And it was so empowering to me. It was so illuminating. And I just fell more in love with the conservation uh, field because of the people who are dedicated uh, to ensuring that, that these animals um, have their rightful place and, and are, are safe and protected in their natural habitats. Um, in terms of, of, of our own animals and, and sort of, of, of our pets in, in our um, household, as you heard, I've been to 32 countries, so I'm a bit of a global nomad. Um, my husband and I have been married for 17 years, and during that time, we've had eight international moves. And so because of that, we haven't been able to adopt um, an animal because of just, you know, just the frequent changes in environment. However, we, were, we moved back to the States about a little over a year ago. My son is 10 
And I promised him when we moved back to the States that we would absolutely um, adopt an, a, a dog actually. And so we are looking at the sort of the best fit for our family now. So I'm hoping to update you on our, our new fur baby, you know, in a couple of, a couple of months, but if, if, if it's up to my son, a couple of weeks, but it's going to be a couple of months. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Well, Tammy, it sounds like you have some new adventures with animals in your near future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, if, if I had one message for, for you all, it, it would really be that it takes a village to do this work and to make the impact for animals and people that we're striving for. Um, whether that's keeping our frontline staff, our rescue and conservation staff equipped and ready in the field, from rescuing dolphins on the beach on Cape Cod to working with communities to coexist with wildlife in Malawi and Kenya, um, whether it's supporting our policy experts and helping them to advocate effectively, you know, in the halls of parliament and Congress, whether it's the storytelling, getting, getting the amazing stories of the animals and, and the people to our supporters and to stakeholders to really build our credibility and, and influence to, to make change. There is so much behind the scenes and so many people behind the scenes that make that possible. And that certainly includes, you know, we and all of our colleagues around the world, but it really includes you. Every time that you make a donation, that you share on social media, that you talk about our issues and about our work to friends and family, you are helping all of this happen. You are making it possible. And I know that we will continue to rely on you to help us do that. And so really just a big thank you for everything that you do um, to, to make an impact. Um, in terms of my, my experiences and, and story, I grew up on Cape Cod, which is, is I've been very blessed. It's, it's a very beautiful, pristine coastal environment with lots of protected land. So I grew up spending a lot of time outdoors by the sea, in the forest, in the marsh, on a whale watch, etc. cetera. Uh, grew up with cats and dogs. Um, and then when I was in university, I had the opportunity to study abroad in Ghana and West Africa. And that was where I had the chance to see my first elephants in the wild. And that was just such an incredibly powerful experience. It really stuck with me. And so years later, when I had the opportunity to come and work for IFA and actually help to establish our Middle East and North Africa office at that time, I just jumped at it. I, it was a dream job and I never looked back and I've just had so many wonderful opportunities to make a difference since I've, since I've been here. Um, in terms of my own pets, um, I have a rescue cat named Gizmo. He is eight years old. My daughter picked him out from our local shelter, I guess, six years ago now. Um, he's a total love. He's, I, he's sleeping, I think, right behind me. So I think you can see that little ball, that little black ball. That's him. I won't disturb him right now. Um, he is a cuddle bug, but he's also a bit of a rascal. He loves to chew papers, books, cords, etc. So I have to keep my eye out on him. Uh, thank you, Katie. It sounds like your gizmo is quite the little gourmet. <laughs> um, working in donor relations, the question that we very often hear is, what can I do to help animals besides just making donations? And we tell them that there are many, many ways uh, first, you can be a great advocate for animals just by sharing our newsletters, our emails, and our social media posts with your family and friends. Mm -hmm. You can learn what animal-related bills might be pending in your local state or the federal legislation. Contact your representatives with your comments. Ask them to vote in an animal-friendly way and explain to them why that is, that is important. Learn, um, refuse to buy ivory, fur, horn, or any other wildlife products and educate others to do the same. When you travel, please avoid activities like swimming with dolphins or cub petting or any of the other activities that exploit animals. Educate others to do this as well and explain to them why these activities are cruelty in disguise. They're, they're not fun, they're cruelty. If you eat meat, eggs, dairy, look for labels that indicate that these animals were humanely raised. Talk to your grocer, tell them please to carry more animal friendly products. 
and explain to them why that's important and that you only want to buy products that have that type of labeling. Mm -hmm. You can set out bird feeders, you can set out bird, bird houses, you can plant only native plants that will provide cover and food for wildlife and won't compete with the native plants that are there as well. Please don't buy exotic plants because they do cause harm. You want to plant out some flowers so that pollinators like bees and butterflies who are seriously in decline so that they have food and cover as well. Don't use chemical pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers that harm wildlife as well as plants and people. You can adopt a pet from a shelter or a rescue group rather than from a pet store or a backyard breeder. If you're especially interested in older pets, that's wonderful because so many people pass over the older pets to adopt puppies. If you're interested in hands-on work with animals, you can contact your state or your local disaster animal response team for information about volunteer training or contact your local shelter or rescue group to see if they have a volunteer program or if they have a fostering program so that you can foster a pet waiting for a forever home. And last, but certainly not least, if you live on Cape Cod, you can apply to train with our awesome marine mammal rescue team located right here in Yarmouthport. Just give us an email at info at ifaw.org and we'll be happy to tell you how you can go about that. Where did my love for animals come from? I'd have to say it's in my genes because my mother and father were both animal lovers. My first dog was a Border Collie Husky mix that my parents adopted at six months old. She was, or six, six weeks old, I'm sorry, <laughs> from the Poughkeepsie SPCA shelter. I was only four years old at the time and, and I grew up with her. Um, we always had bird feeders, we always planted flowers, we always watched the butterflies and the bees and the birds and even a big garden spider that was in one of our plants one summer. We watched his whole life cycle through the year. Um, I, I grew up in beautiful upstate New York and rode horses every chance that I got and my parents spent endless hours watching me either in the show ring or at the arena at a wonderful place called Netherwoods Acres. We always watch nature shows together and discuss them afterwards. And I'll date myself here because some of those nature shows were in black and white <laughs> before color TV was around. Um, I think it's really important to teach young children at a very, very young age to appreciate and respect animals and nature. I know I'm grateful for the lessons I learned from my own parents. And now I'd like to share my own canine family, Venice and Honey, who are also my office partners. And let me just wake Venice, I uh, wake little honey up here. <laughs> Captain Kirk's a new friend. See honey. The others? Where is she? Oh. This is Miss Honey. Honey is about 12 years old. We adopted her two years ago. She was dumped at a high kill shelter in southern Texas and she was in very rough shape at the time. Um, my husband and I, um, we over the years, we've adopted nine dachshunds and seven of them were senior rescues. And I, I also volunteer for two national dachshund rescue groups. Mm. And here comes Venice. And Mr. Venice, he's going to celebrate his 16th birthday in <laughs> September. And he can be quite the little ham. He loves being told how wonderful he is and how adorable he is, especially when he's showing off the tricks that he knows. In addition to a wall full of certificates and ribbons that he's earned, he's also been made oh. mayor of Yarmouth for it by many of the local business businesses that we visit. He can be a little bit camera shy, so I'm going to let him go back to enjoying a snooze by the fireplace. He's very, very warm right now. <laughs> and we'll take him back out there. <laughs> And it's been very, very nice being with all of you this evening, um, my wonderful colleagues and all of our awesome supporters and uh, just keep up the great work. Well, thanks, Phoebe. That's a tough act to follow. I'm not sure that I could really <laughs> surmount that one, but I think if I just, and I'm looking at the clock because I know we want to get to questions. I think if I had one message to the, I see over 200 people who have joined us this evening, you are part of a, our global movement of over 4 million individuals who are supporting us in a variety of ways around the globe, like-minded good men and women who really wanna advance the agenda for animals and wildlife and conservation. So thank you very much for being a part of it. 
Um, I too have an animal story. I have my rescue dog, Percy, who um, we're very fortunate to be able to bring our pets to work. So Percy loves coming to the office. I'll see if I can get him on camera here, excuse me. This is Percy, he's not such a ham, but um, he's, um, he's 13 years old and uh, he loves attention, but he loves to sleep too. So I think, but he'll stay for the rest of the show. <laughs> but he probably won't answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Percy, hi honey, hi Venice. <laughs> It was so great. Thank you all so much for your words of encouragement, gratitude, knowledge, and passion. And again, hello to your beloved four-legged companions. Captain Kirk, so excited to share the spotlight with them. Glad you can join us for our Q&As. So it's now time to take some questions. Uh, viewers, please go ahead and start typing in your questions for our panelists. Use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Please don't type in any questions in the chat just the Q&A box. And if you could please let me know who the question is for by typing in the panelist's name before the question so we can direct the questions directly at the panelists. If not, I'll just select a panelist for the question and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the time allotted. I know it is getting late, so we'll go ahead and start with some questions. Let's see here. We have a question from Camille. Camille. And um, she didn't direct this question to anybody. So I'm just going to um, go ahead and pose it and panelists just raise your hand if you feel that you want to answer it. Hi, I'm a senior at Wheaton College and I'm hoping to get into conservation soon. How can people coming into the field maintain hope about the future of wildlife in the face of all the doom and gloom info we are bombarded with about climate change, species, extinction, habitat, degradation, et cetera? Oh, such a good question. Cheryl, would you like to answer? Um, I don't know if I have the answer, but I can, I can sort of give my perspective, I guess. Um, yeah. Because there is a lot of doom and gloom. There's a lot of terrible news out there. So, I mean, personally, sometimes I'm very selective about the media I consume, the social media I consume. I think there's a, there's a line between being aware of some of the negative things that are happening in the world and feeling empowered to make a difference to change that and just being overwhelmed by it and just feeling hopeless. So I think just being always aware of what media you're, you're consuming and look for those opportunities where you can make a difference. There's you know, invariably almost something that you can, if there's not, look for the places where you can make a difference um, to help animals to make a positive change because more often than not, there's, there's always something you can do. Um, one of the things that's been encouraging for me lately, I think is, just seeing a lot more collaboration and cooperation between organizations or between individuals who I think historically have kind of been at odds with each other. I think we're getting to a point now where it's like people are waking up. It's like, this is serious. We need to work together to find solutions um, and sort of put some of our differences at size. It doesn't mean we're gonna agree with everybody on everything, but I think it's really important to, to find the areas of common ground and to try to work together with others to make the difference that we, that we can. So mm -hmm. that's, I know that's not the, that's not a full answer. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Tammy, would you like to say something about that question? I think that was a great answer, Cheryl, <laughs> actually. Um, I would like to say something and it's so interesting. And, and I did, you know, talk about a little bit of Jane Goodall's sort of wisdom in terms of every individual matters and every individual makes a difference, but even more personalized, you know, I lost my uh, grandmother this year, who was the matriarch of our family and a font of wisdom. My grandmother was a cotton sharecropper in South Carolina, in the fields of South Carolina. And she raised a granddaughter who became an Ivy League graduate, right? When she was born, not only what, what would I and she have not been able to be in the Ivy Leagues, but as a black person, I wouldn't have been there, but as a woman, I wouldn't have been there, right? So in her lifetime, she actually got to see her granddaughter um, achieve everything that, uh, you know, that she had wanted to achieve. And so one of the things I'm always saying is that as long as you breathe, there's a reason for hope. And if you are involved in the struggle, if you are participating, if you're engaged in the practice, you actually don't have time to be disillusioned because you're too busy doing the work to affect change. So put one foot in front of the other and do what makes sense to you and, and, and actually wake up and, and do what's 
what makes you actually uh, sort of most passionate in the world. And, and, and that is the, the substance of change. That is the, the substance to me um, actually of hope. And I uh, got to sort of hear those stories of my grandmother very full circle and, and just, and I, I actually um, was very lucky because I was one of the last, I was the last person to see her before she passed away. Mm -hmm. And so, and we talked about uh, her journeys, uh, so interestingly enough. So that's just sort of wisdom from a 90-year-old woman who was a cotton sharecropper, who raised a granddaughter, who was an Ivy League graduate, and she never thought she would see that. Um, so there's a reason for hope. Thank you, Tammy. That's such a beautiful story. There's always room for hope. Mm -hmm. So we have another question here from Shantarella, and this question is for Katie Miller. Could you please expand upon the land lease program? How does it work? And what were some of the biggest obstacles encountered? Is the program effective across countries? What an awesome question. And we could probably have a whole vlog just on that. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't presume to speak for my, my Kenyan colleagues who could, who could elaborate with a lot more sophistication. But what I, what I can say is that, you know, we're working our ampicilli our ATK project is working along the border of Kenya and Tanzania, and this is a critical elephant landscape, as well as the, the, the homeland of, the, of different, different communities of Maasai. And so we've been working for many years now with, well, the OOGR, I will not give you their, their full name, the OOGR Group Ranch, which is, which is the particular community that we are working in along that border. And so traditionally, the Maasai use their land communally, pastoralism, um, cows, really, are, that's their livelihood, that's their source of wealth, and they maintain that, even though many of them also have you know, other professions and things that they do. And so, you know, as, as land has been divided in Kenya, kind of what we know as traditional property rights is a relatively new thing. And so the danger is that suddenly a lot of people suddenly have a deed to a very small piece of land and in the short term the incentive can be well i can get a little bit of money now if i sell off my piece of land um, the problem is a that that little bit of money today you know what will happen tomorrow but also for for conservation it means that suddenly the landscape that elephants and people shared is being cut up by development and no longer connected. And that's going to, you know, really affect the, the viability of that, of that elephant population, but it's also going to have really serious impacts on the, the local community as they lose that, you know, they lose their, they give up their property mm -hmm. without a long-term, you know, sustainable future for themselves. And so land leasing is a way of working, negotiating. We really negotiated with the community as a whole and their, their local leadership to come to agreement with, you know, thousands of individual landholders to say, we will lease the land from you at this price over a period of time. And it meant organizing a payment system. How do you make sure that each landowner is, it, you have their information and you can pay them. So, I mean, that, that's basically the, how it works. Um, we've been able, we've been doing it for some time now, and it's not the, the end goal. The end goal is to help the community use that land to generate eco-sustainable income for themselves. Um, but this is the way that we, we give ourselves the breathing room to help them achieve that. Great, thank you, Katie. And it's such a fascinating project. I'd love to dive into it deeper. So perhaps another vlog episode will be on that. <laughs> thank you. We have another question here from um, Simone. And this is a question for Cheryl. And the question is, what's happening with the seal slaughter in Canada? Excellent question. <laughs> um, and I get to talk about good news, so I love that one. Um, the, the seal hunt, as I mentioned earlier, has been in steep decline since the European Union ban of 2009, followed by the Russian ban on seal products in 2011. Um, out of a quota, quota of 400,000 seal pups that are authorized to be killed, only 395 seals were killed last year as part of the commercial seal hunt. Now, some of that is because of COVID and the commercial hunt was canceled. But even so in the prior year, I think it was, I should have the number, but I think a 95% reduction in the number of seals that are being killed each year compared to what it was previously. So the industry is in huge decline. 
um, we're still we're still keeping our finger on the our pressure on. Um, our focus right now is more focusing on the federal government of Canada to stop subsidizing the seal hunt. We need them to recognize this is an industry that they tried to bring back from the dead in the 1990s. It was successful for a little bit, but it's a dying industry. There are no markets for seal products. People don't want to buy seal products. Um, and really there's better ways to support communities in Atlantic Canada. So one of the things we're working on now is encouraging the government to instead invest in things like removing ghost gear and marine plastics from the ocean, things that will make a healthier habitat for marine wildlife and better, safer oceans for all of us. So that's kind of where we're focused now. But um, as I say, there's, we're not really sure what's going to happen this year. Um, I think last year was a bit of an anomaly, very encouraging. Um, but I'm I'm optimistic that people are starting to realize this hunt is on its way out. Thank you, Cheryl. Let's all keep that hope alive for that to ring true. Um, the next question here, this is for Terry. This um, question is from Steve, and Steve saying, first of all, you are all so awesome. I concur. So awesome. Um, I have been to Kenya several times and with all the poaching and wildlife habitat impacts, where do you see the most important efforts being concentrated to conserve wildlife and their habitats for the next 20 years? I am overwhelmed with species population declines and the overarching threat of extinction and habitat conservation to avocado farms um, for these globally significant species. Thank you, Steve, for that question. So 20 years, where do you see that um, concentration to conser for conservation wildlife? Where's the most important? Where is that going to happen, Terry? I think, you know, there are many places where that's going to happen, but we're currently um, involved in a very exciting project called Room to Roam, where we're securing um, corridors for wildlife in Kenya um, Zimbabwe, uh, Malawi, and Zambia. And um, it's really essential. It's a really long-term project because as you've heard this evening, the process of securing land um, for animals and people in a mutually beneficial way is something that takes a very, very long time. So what you've also heard is we're in it for the long haul. So this is really a very ambitious project. Um, we're currently securing core funding to make sure that we can um, position ourselves for the long term, but it's really essential that we work alongside lots of other partners, we can't do it alone, to really secure these corridors, not only for elephants, although elephants as keystone species really are essential for all other species to benefit. So um, I would say that is the one area that IFA has really committed to for the long haul. And I'm sure that you all will hear more about this project over the next couple of years because we are going to be building and growing and reaching out to others to really help us achieve some very, very ambitious goals for the elephants. Thank you, Terry. So we are, um, you know, we could be going on and on forever, but I'd like to ask a question here to um, um, Phoebe here. This is a question from Anonymous. Um, they said, for all those amazing women, I've worked in veterinary medicine for 20 years, specializing in exotic pet medicine. I've become so depressed and angry about the exotic pet trade that I need to make a change. What would make the most impact in your opinion? Would it be politics, working for IFAL, volunteering, becoming a lawyer? Phoebe is someone who transitioned her career um, can you have any advice for our anonymous attendee? Wow, <laughs> any <laughs> one of those suggestions um, that you had would, would be excellent. Um, but we, we do have to start right in our own backyard. Um, start educating your friends, your family, um, share any social media posts, um, not only from IFA, but from any other groups that might be working on this, this issue. It is a terrible thing. In the United States alone, there are more tigers in captivity than, than there are in the wild, which is very shocking. And, and a lot of people are amazed to hear that. Um, it's just a, a terrible, terrible truth, and it's something that does have to be stopped. And if we want to stop any future pandemics, we also have to stop this type of trade because 
obviously um, COVID, SARS, um, some of the other pandemics in the past have jumped from animals to humans. So we've got to really start to rethink our relationship with nature and, and how we treat nature and, and of the habitats that these animals live in as well. And ripping these animals out of the wild and making them live in unnatural situations, it is very, very wrong. Something that's definitely got a, an end has to come to it. But we do have to start right at the grassroots level um, with just getting the word out, educate people. Um, mm -hmm. You can go into any one of a, a number of fields, um, you know, whether you don't have to be a veterinarian or a biologist, um, just basically any, any field. If you love animals, you can do whatever you can do on your own, um, on your off time as, as well. Um, but it, it's just education and getting the word out, I think is the number one most important thing because when people hear about what's going on with wildlife and, and the absolute devastation of our habitats and, and of our species, that something will change someday. But as Cheryl mentioned, change takes time sometimes. Um, and it took us about 18 years to end the fox hunt in the UK. We're still working on the seal hunt generations later. So this is something, it's, it's even more urgent, I think right now with the exotic pet trade because of the situation with, with global pandemics. Thank you, Phoebe. And I think on that, it's important, you know, we said previously that every individual matters and this applies here as well because every person you communicate to, every person you educate and talk to about these things makes a difference. Um, and, and like Tammy said, it's the collective choices of a group of people that makes the impact. So I'll just leave with one more question. This is for Tammy. Um, and then we do have to wrap up. I can't believe it's getting so late. Um, Tammy, you mentioned community-based work to protect wildlife. Can you expand on that idea? Yeah, community-based work is really the principle um, that in order to achieve sustainable conservation goals, we really do have to take the needs of the community into account as well, right? They are partners. We want to achieve buy-in. So um, not only do we, let's take an example in thinking about sort of chimpanzee conservation and the conservation of chimp habitats, we not only want to achieve that, but we want to ensure that the communities that are around chimp habitats are actually healthy because zoonotic disease is one of the biggest threats to chimpanzees in Eastern Africa, for example. So if the communities around those chimp habitats aren't healthy, then those chimp populations will ultimately also be susceptible to diseases. So community-based conservation means that when we go into communities as IFA or other conservation organizations, we should be working with regional governments or local governments to ensure that there are medical facilities, medical centers, right, that can deliver primary care to those communities so that the communities are healthy, but also the chimpanzees that are, I mean, and very literally adjacent to those human communities are also safe and healthy. So community-based conservation is really premised on dual goals. One goal is the sort of securing the health and protection of, chimp, of, of any animal and its habitat. The other goal is, a, is basically securing the health and the economic well-being of the communities that surround those habitats because that's where sustainability lives. If those communities are sustainable and not um, deriving their income from let's say an illicit wildlife trade, then we have community-based conservation. And, uh, the same could be, you know, said for education, health, economic development. Those are all essential components of community-based conservation. And again, that's where we see more sustainable impact. I feel another vlog topic coming on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so everyone, I, we have just so many questions coming in and I'm sorry. Whoops. Alarm. <laughs> um, so we do have so many questions, but we have to wrap up. Um, so that's all the questions we have time for today. Everyone who's watching, please don't forget to hear all the latest updates from IFAL by visiting our website, ifall.org. And thank you again, Cheryl, Tammy, Phoebe, Terry, Katie, Percy, Gizmo, and Honey for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing everyone on June 9th 
for our ninth episode of our video blog series. Take care, everyone, and stay healthy. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.